now on Dimension 5. Good evening. A Roman dramatist once said, time heals all wounds. Just as the emotional wounds of Vietnam are beginning to heal with time, we're now being faced with some new reminders, reminders which bring back memories of that painful war. But the biggest reminder is probably the most subtle, inflation. Now in the late 70s, we're paying the price for not tightening our belts in the war years. As economists say, we enjoyed both guns and butter instead of paying as we went. The second great reminder is now coming at us in the theater. Last year, there was the movie Coming Home and the movie The Boys and Company C, but they were just starters. Next month, EMI Films will release The Deer Hunter, a Vietnam movie critics call immensely powerful. Newsweek says one scene is one of the most frightening, unbearably tense sequences ever filmed. During 1969 and 70, I was stationed with the Army in Vietnam. I took a 16 millimeter camera along and filmed weekly reports for KSL. Our first dimension is a reflection piece. Some of the things I remember there as a reporter and some of those early moods captured by local soldiers themselves. Vietnam, 1969. It was the peak of the war with hundreds of Americans dying there every week. A war which was gradually escalated by four American presidents. My job in the Army was not a lot unlike the civilian job I had at KSL when a draft notice appeared in my mailbox. In the service, I produced and anchored television newscasts. I worked at one of five military television stations in Vietnam, mine located just 15 miles south of the demilitarized zone between North and South Vietnam. Our broadcast unit, made up mostly of Marines and Navy personnel, manned this compound at Quang Tri. That first building on the left was our radio station. The next building, our clubhouse, living quarters, an administration building, and the van. It housed our television broadcast equipment, and it contained a tiny newsroom where I did the newscasts. I had one day off a week, a day I used to travel to put together stories to send back home to KSL. <laughs> American politicians may not have been ingenious enough to win the war in Vietnam, but American soldiers were ingenious enough to make the best of a very frustrating situation. Yes, Virginia, those stories you hear on television programs like MASH are based on truth. Zanism has a way of being amplified in war zones, whether Korea, Italy, or Vietnam. Meet Specialist Kuntz, a military mechanic. Kuntz comes right out of the stereotype developed in television's MASH, he could be to the maintenance corps what Hawkeye was to the medical corps. Kuntz had a total disregard for military discipline, but he had a reputation for work efficiency which covered Northern I Corps. Here's a slide of Kuntz's work bay. He constructed a front to make it appear like a barn, complete with weather vane. Greek-style pillars were adorned with giant peace symbols. The grease pit painted outrageous purple. His commanding officer didn't have the muscle to get Kuntz to tear it down. So the officer did it himself while Kuntz was off on rest and recreation. Kuntz, by the way, was from Salt Lake. Once he fashioned a go-kart racetrack by tearing down part of the perimeter fence, and he burned up the track using go-karts he made with scrounged parts. His pride and joy was a jeep he cut down to make a wheelie machine. That really infuriated his superiors, but Kuntz did take parts off his jeep to keep military versions running. The Utah was most in demand for the hard-to-get parts he kept buried near his go-kart track. If a general's jeep broke down, the general knew where to come. Here's one of several barter commodities popular in the military, sea rations. They're supposed to be used just for troops in the field, but those soldiers at the bases often preferred sea rations to the mess hall. And you could get stuff with barter items like sea rations you couldn't get through official channels. Just before I left Quang Tri, I traded a jeep trailer full of sea rations for enough two-by-fours and plywood to build a new broadcast building on our compound. Pound cake and beans with francs were among the most popular items. 
Black soldiers in Vietnam developed a highly sophisticated set of handshakes, almost Masonic in flavor. Handshakes which promoted their brotherhood and strengthened their identity. The style would vary from base to base. Soul Train, he's the big white soldier on the far right, was one of our radio disc jockeys. He had a soul music show. Soul Train, on the air, would use an ethnic accent, and most of his black fans thought he was a brother in the flesh as well as in the spirit. It was amusing to see their shocked looks when they saw him in person. These soldiers, by the way, worked in a warehouse. We couldn't get new tires for our Jeep through Army channels. Soul Train convinced his brothers they should give us a set under the table. They gave us three sets, so we'd have something left over for bartering. The Vietnamese are a deeply religious people. Buddhism is the dominant religion, but the governments, while I was there, were dominated by a Catholic minority whose interests would often clash with the Buddhists. The Buddhists tended to favor a negotiated settlement to the war. The religious conflicts within South Vietnam, it appeared to me, were greater than the external communist versus non-communist conflict. The Buddhist monks often led protests against expansion of the war. Well, Mom, Dad, uh, I'll be home pretty soon. Okay, Mike, good luck to you the rest of the tour, and we'll see you uh, pretty soon back there in the Salt Lake area, huh? Thank you, sir. Okay. That's Corporal Michael Totten from Murray, Utah. This is Dick Norris for KSL News on a Marine outpost outside Da Nang, South Vietnam. Two years before I was in Vietnam, Dick Norris made a month-long trip there. In his reports, Dick did not try to background the war as I did. His mission was to talk with as many Utahns as he could to get their opinions of the conflict. What do you think mostly about since you've been out here? Home and uh, girl, things like this? Well, I guess girls would be the best. And then home, you always think about going back there. The protests move around the world, and more particularly in the United States at the present time, the draft card burners and the demonstrations and what have you. Everybody should go. If they're called, they should go. I don't see any sense why they should try to get out of it. I think it's a pretty chicken way to do things. I don't think much of them. Like Danny said, if uh, I wouldn't want to have one of them guys helping me if I had to stake my life on somebody like that. I don't think you can trust them very far. This postman's made third class Kenneth Magnum from Panguitch, Utah. Ken, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your job here in this, this village, in the reconstruction of this village? We are here to help these people build houses, to supervise them in many projects as the sanitation program should be started. Shortly now, we are putting out trash barrels for them to uh, pick up trash and keep in there. As you notice, you come through the village, there's garbage along the side of the road. That is one of our main projects to help clean up the garbage and the disease around this area. Among those Dick interviewed was an information officer from Utah. It's been the philosophy of the Department of Army for a long time that the American public is entitled to know what's going on in the military services. And consequently, there is a great deal of effort to telling factually the public what the Army is doing. Actually, the, the role of an information officer, either at my level here, where I am the information officer for the Army, for the entire Army in Vietnam, but whether it's at my level or whether it's at uh, one of the subordinate fighting levels, the information job is still essentially the same. That the credibility is, of Army officials later became a major issue of the war. Dick and KSL producer Larry Finnegan scoured the war zone, talking to at least 80 soldiers. Not too much, really, I can tell you. While in Saigon, Dick was standing on a street corner when some Vietnamese boys approached. Dick says they called him and Larry cowboys, but he couldn't understand much else. How old are you, Ang? How are you, Ang? How old? What's your name? Uh, my name's Dick. What's your name? My name's... How old are you? Ten. Ten? You're ten years old? What's your name? Ten. Huh? Ten. Huh? What? How old are you? Me. 
Uh, yeah. I How can. old? I can. Ten years old? Yeah, he's no ten. He's fifteen. He's fifteen? You're awful short for fifteen, aren't you? Dick says his trip to Vietnam changed his opinion of the war. He said he recognized in 1967 that it was an unwinnable war and America should get out. It took five bloody years before government officials faced that fact. You painted up your lips and rolled and curled your tinted hair. Ruby, are you contemplating going out somewhere? 1969 and one of the nation's top hits, the song Ruby by Kenny Rogers. The tune was played widely on the Armed Forces Radio Network until a military official took note of its lyrics and banned the record outright. Those lyrics describe the mental anguish of a returned Vietnam veteran paraplegic whose wife steps out on him. It wasn't me that started that old crazy Asian war. But I was proud to go and do my patriotic chore. The banning of Ruby was a commentary of military officials who refused to admit the social tragedies of war. It was a record which came out before frustration with our involvement there had even hit its zenith. I still need some company. The helicopter evacuation of wounded begun in Korea was perfected in Vietnam. It's the day before Christmas, 1969. I accompanied the medevac rescue of some wounded South Vietnamese troops. The courage of the helicopter pilots who routinely sat down in the battlefield is legend. The day I went on the operation, bodies were literally stacked inside the chopper. The medevac personnel worked frantically to get the wounded on board, both to minimize delay to the hospital and to minimize exposure to enemy fire. At least two of the wounded died en route back to the base. The others went straight to the emergency operating rooms. On my day off, I did news stories. What did the medics do on their days off? They went to the villages to treat South Vietnamese civilians. The program was called MedCat, and its aim, to upgrade medical services to the civilians. During weekly visits, mothers would seek American medical help for their children. One boy, medics were certain, was a member of the Viet Cong and had injured his leg during a night raid. But this day, he sought American help. He was given it no questions asked. At the MedCap, I saw some Vietnamese imagination. This is a toy machine gun, complete with a rat-tat-tat device, some boys made out of miscellaneous parts. There were other views of the war zone. Marijuana smoking among troops was extremely high, the military making only token efforts to curb its use. This armed forces television campaign tried to show that marijuana use can lead to death. The most popular story I did was merely one covering an LDS conference in Da Nang. Elder Bruce R. McConkie came over to speak, and it was the easiest place to film rows full of Utahns. In all, I filed 36 reports during 1969 and 1970. <laughs> In a moment, Dwayne Cardall returns with a look at the man behind the restoration of Nauvoo.